Hi, everyone. This is Coach DeMarco with another Get Better Basketball Live, and I'm fortunate today to be here with Coach Dan Jonker, who's an assistant coach at Mohawk College. How are you doing today, Coach? I'm great, John. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. And uh, Dan also uh, has Coach Calls Time Out, which is a great website with hundreds of resources um, that it's actually my go-to when I'm ever, whenever I'm looking for uh, great resources. Um, so, Dan, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, Coach Call's time and then our topic for today, which is going to be zone offense. Um, and I think there's going to be something for everyone as we discuss zone offense with Dan. Uh, but maybe you can take us through uh, a little bit about Coach Call's timeout and then um, jump into uh, zone offense. Yeah, sure. So real quick, um, I run a website called Coach Call's Timeout uh, with my two brothers as well, who are coaches as well. Um, and we have hundreds of resources, like you said, in plays and drills, practice plans for coaches to make their lives easier. Uh, one of the unique things that we do is our plays are not the, the typical screenshots where you just see the arrows and the X's and the screens and all that kind of stuff. We actually have animated video playbook and we find that the players are players learn a lot easier that way. Um, when coaches are sharing it with the kids, they seem to, to remember those things. Kids love video, and it's, it's been a great resource so far for a lot of our coaches. That's awesome. I really appreciate you sharing that, Dan. And, uh, you know, hopefully um, as we go through, I think coaches will see, as you talk about zone offense, the tremendous knowledge you have of the game. And I do want to say I love the way you diagram stuff out. I feel like it's easier to follow than a lot of the things I see out there. Um, so I appreciate the way in which um, you do it. Um, yeah, so thanks. I've always had today. one of my pet peeves was those those still shots. You never know the timing, <laughs> which is critical to a successful play or drill or whatever. It's just the timing is kind of ambiguous at times. So it, we were like, let's just create a little animated plays and see what we can do. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. So if you want to jump in here and start talking zone offense, um, I'm really sure. excited about this because I get a ton of questions about zone offense. So to have you come in and share on that topic, I think there's going to be a lot of value in this for coaches. Sure. So I've, what I'm going to talk about is how to simplify teaching zone offense. The, the main thing I'll try to share my screen here is as uh, seamlessly as I can. Um, so the main thing that I look for when we're, when we're teaching zone offense is just one goal. Keep the, the talking points simple. Don't make it any harder than it needs to be. And that one goal is just to create and find many three on two, two on one situations. So what does that mean? We're gonna go through all different ways how you can find those situations. I'll just give you a little quick clip here of, of what I mean by many three on two, two on one situations. With this skip pass out of the, the post, you can see two defenders recovering towards the ball and we've got three offensive guys who are ready and willing to, to attack at any point. So as the ball gets closer, we can see the defense chooses what he's gonna do. He's jumping the gap, trying to stop that pass to the big man down low. This defender up top has guarded the point guard. So now that's gonna create a zone or a a line straight to the basket for a quick pull up. So those are the kinds of little situations that we try to teach. And when it's broken down that simply, I find that the player's IQ actually increases dramatically. I mean, when they start breaking it down, instead of five on five, now you're just looking at what's the next pass to make that, to gain that advantage. Coach, if I <laughs> just stay all for a second, I, I yep. love, um, how you simplify that because I think a lot of coaches and I'm thinking of youth coaches, high school coaches, and even beyond that, um, they think of zone offense and I get a lot of questions about like, what set can I run? And I love the way that you're really thinking about it in terms of advantages, three on two and two on one advantages and really building in decision-making. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this because, you know, I, I think it's, there's so much value in that for coaches who are looking for the perfect set. And I know there's some ways to take advantage through the sets that you run, but yeah. there's also, you know, this part of it, which is 
you know, creating those mini three on two, two on ones, and then using some of your sets to obviously, um, you know, take advantage. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not opposed to set, but I know that the game is moving towards less structure. Um, and this is a great way, especially with a continuous, continuous motion offense against the zone or against man to man, whatever you want to do. This is a great way to kind of break it down into simpler terms for, for your players. So there's all kinds of different ways to create these situations. We'll just run through all of them as quick. I'll go quickly. And if people have questions um, who are watching it, they can reach out to me or you, and I'm happy to answer anything that, that comes up. Uh, the first is alignment and spacing. That's the simple thing. So we can either be one, two, two set, one, three, one, all kinds of different things, one, four high, one, four low, four out, five out, all kinds of different. And as you see these different sets or different alignments, you can tell what's going to be good against each zone. Like this one, four out, the way it's structured right now might not be good against the two, three zone because they're going to be able to just man up and, and play. Um, and then five out. And then overloads are kind of a separate category. So we're going to yeah, so we'll we'll go ahead, get into the overloads here. Um, as you can see, the two, this is Duke against Syracuse. Two wing players are coming to the right side. And you can see already just from the first pass where this next, if you think of everything in terms of three on two, two on one, you can see exactly where the next, where this two on one is. The ball is going to the wing. Nobody's guarding the bottom. So it depends totally on what this defender does. He chooses to try to take the passing angle out, goes to the corner. Now the shooter wasn't really ready, pass wasn't great. So then now we're into another two on one with the big man, guy in the corner against the recovering defender. And as, it, as he attacks, now there's a two on one in the backside of the zone. So it all depends on what happens with the defenders. And then we get a, a foul on the shot. So there's always, you're always thinking next pass, next pass, where's the advantage? What's the next advantage? If you're, when you're teaching this, if, if the, the players are not, if they're just dribbling for the sake of dribbling or just throw a weak pass somewhere else, you should always be thinking, what can I do to create this advantage? Um, and these are all the different things. Next, we'll get ball movement and fit ball fakes. Um, so it's as simple as moving the ball quickly, or it's as simple as a pass fake to shift the defenders. Um, right here, you can see the as the as the ball swung around, it's getting confusing for Syracuse to keep up just be, just because of simple quick passes. Next, we got attack or fill gaps. So with Duke here, there's a huge gap right down the middle. He doesn't take it here; he takes it so that when we're attacking the gaps, we want two players to defend us. So there's two players guarding the ball. Now we've got one shooter and another player kind of out of sight here um, or out of shooting range. So ball gets kicked out. Shooter is not ready. He's not a great shooter anyway, but um, shooter's not ready. And because of that, he's thinking too much. He could have one more pass for a swing instead it's a lost possession. So next time down, they run this same thing. And this time O'Connell says, forget it. I'm not kicking it out to you guys. I'm going down low where there is two because the big man is stepping up and this wing uh, bottom defender is already out of position. The two on one is with the big, the ball handler against the man in the middle. So oh, just just in terms of um, the you know creating those two on ones and I, and you mentioned you know you, you want to attack gaps where you can force two defenders to converge on you and then obviously that's going to open up some other players. Uh, what are some of the things that you guys do as a team, or maybe just one coaching point that you could share with coaches to to encourage or to teach your players, um, you know? how to how to draw those two defenders because we see in that set which was really nice how he drew both times the same two defenders one time he kicked one time he didn't so is are there any coaching points or anything that you guys do as a team to, to teach this 
to be honest, when you're, when you're thinking about that two on one um, or three on two, you can see, okay, as he's, as he's attacking, in my mind, I don't think he's attacking looking to score at all. He's just attacking trying to get those two guys, two top defenders, to be occupied because he knows he has the other two guys up top here. That's a three on two, pretty clear. And so he's just sacrificing himself basically so that the other two guys can be open. If you think in terms of that all the time, attacking gaps, because I think a lot of people stop with attacking because they don't think they're gonna get through. But if you're attacking those gaps and you know, you can pick up the ball as you're getting to the gap because two guys are gonna die, to collapse uh, two players are going to collapse on you and you can throw that pass you don't have to keep possession you don't have to keep your dribble alive you can literally dive in between them and throw the pass out um, so it's a lot easier thinking it in this kind of terms and I, I find that people are a lot more aggressive as well they don't kind of sit back on their heels because they're always thinking where's the advantage where's the advantage uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but no, no, it does. I know. I think that's a great answer. And I think you do see players sometimes hesitate to attack those gaps because they don't feel like they're going to get through to finish. And, and that's a great coaching point right there that, you know, when you get into the paint and you have players converge on you, someone's going to be open. And, you know, the first time we saw the kick and, you know, the guy maybe didn't make the best decision, the shot or the one more, but the second time it was a drive and a dump and, and, you know, you can see the player, uh, down at the bottom who's open here so no that that does and I think that's a great coaching point out there for coaches too so we'll take a look at uh I got a couple more here for attack and fill gaps um this is the same thing now one of the things that um that we love to do or talk about is when you're attacking like this so 33 is attacking even as he's attacking, four of these defenders are staring at the ball. One is like, oh, shoot, we're in trouble here. I got, <laughs> I got to cover too many people. So as you're attacking, one of the easiest ways to, to find somebody, and it might not be the easiest, but it's always open, is to throw it to where you just came from. Because this defender is passing off you. And all you literally have to do is turn and throw it back. If Well, 13 fills back in here. He's not going to do that, but that's an easier way um, to, to get a pass. We'll, next clip will show you what I mean. So as it's being swung around, we're still looking at three on two. So again, this is another example of a player just kind of sacrificing himself so that a shooter can get open. He literally has no intention. He could, he could dive through here, but instead he decides I'm going to take on these two defenders so that one of these two guys is open. And he literally doesn't even have to attack at them. He just dribbles towards them and then there's an open shot. So this next one, this is a good example of kind of filling where you came from as, as the drive and he fills back to where the ball came from and is wide open. It happens a lot in, in zone offense. So we've got misdirection. What, what we're talking about with misdirection is, you see in this clip, the natural tendency is to go from wing to top, back to the other wing, and then back up to the top. Well, the misdirection comes. You can see when, as soon as the guy at the top looks to the right, everybody thinks it's gonna be swung again. This defender's already cheating over because he knows he's going to have to guard that guy next. This guy gets lazy because he thinks he's going to be furthest away from the ball. So what happens is it goes back to where it came from, and now you got a big rec recovering against a lightning quick guy, and that's too easy. What I, what I love here, Coach, is you're sharing clips. Um, this is Syracuse, and I mean, arguably, they're the best zone defensive team and to see how these teams are attacking them you know I have to think for coaches out there they're saying this stuff works because yeah. you know whether it's filling gaps or ball movement ball fakes misdirection um, you know this is a great great team that you know these other teams are taking advantage of so 
I just uh, just to interject for a second. I yeah, no, that's that. a that's a good point because when I was going through these uh, game films to to try to find some good clips to use, it's interesting how um, differently each team treats their two three zone. Like Duke, surprisingly, doesn't flash to the middle very much. They don't set screens on the the zone. It's just all attack, attack, attack the gaps and kick out. Um, whereas we'll show you in the middle touches here, um, Notre Dame is just plants a big guy in the middle at all times almost. And a lot of times they change it up and have a shooter in the middle, which we'll talk about here as well. Um, but it's interesting how differently everybody kind of handles it. I guess it depends on personnel and what you're good at. So Absolutely. here's a good one. Um, so this is a trailing forward coming down. Instead of stopping at the top to swing the ball, he just plants himself in the middle. One of the things that I like to say is when you get that ball in the middle, if you're going to score, you need to go quick because there's never going to be a time where you're more open than when you first catch it. You're not going to just stand there and magically get more open. So if you're looking to score or if you think you can score, you need to shoot quick or drive quickly because there's going to be people coming. If you're, if you're guarded, you have a second or two and things will open up as people cut. So if, if you're looking to score, go quick. If you're looking to pass, take your time because things will open up. So here he takes a shot right away. No problem. Next time to the middle and he knows the big guy's worried about that shot. So he's crashing in and then there's obviously a little two on one here, but he finishes with the foul. Coach, I just wanted to point out uh, another another great great point there. Um, you know, you look in the score, go go quick. If you look in the pass, a little more patience in there. You kind of draw on the zone into you. So um, these are these are all little tidbits I think that coaches can really take away, and you know that I'm I'm taking away in each clip that you share. And um, what do you think? And I'm just looking at Notre Dame here versus Duke. And, you know, for you, um, just thinking about it, a lot of teams say put someone at the high post and get the ball into the middle. And interestingly, we talked about Duke not doing that. What, what do you recommend for coaches? And, and maybe really thinking about youth and high school type level coaches versus college, what would you recommend for them, you know, to have someone at the high post or, uh, or not? Or maybe it depends on personnel. But what's your thoughts? I would put my, my best playmaker in the middle even if it's your best shooter, because they're going to make the best decisions and they're going to cause w way more chaos when the ball goes to that person in the middle. Like if you watch even as, as this ball is entered to a big man who hit his shot earlier, but it's still, he's not a threat to, you know, penetrate or anything like that. Every single Syracuse player has turned to look at the ball. If your best playmaker has that, and they're still, you know, six, eight feet away from them. If your best playmaker has five people staring at them, they're going to pick that apart, no problem. Thank so you. So that's what I would do. Either a point guard, best shooter, whatever, whoever can, whoever you trust the most. It always hurts. It's painful sometimes when I watch, I watch like youth ball or whatever. Clearly the coaches, they just think that, that they need that high, low option. So put the two bigs at one at the post or one at the post, one at the foul line, let them rotate and exchange. But they're so uncomfortable when they catch it because they they're not used to having people coming from all directions at them. Mm -hmm. They're used to kind of just surveying over their shoulder and that's about <laughs> it. And <laughs> so yeah, it's I would just put my best player in there. Best awesome. That's me. great, great advice. Appreciate that. Yeah. And then so you watch this one here, because this pass is a tough one to catch. It's you're not really in rhythm to turn and shoot and the Syracuse middle recovers nicely. So he's got some time when he takes a little bit of time, this defender drops just enough. Now all of a sudden you got an open shot. And then the next time even better when it goes to the middle again, everybody's head turns to look at the ball. They've got a two on one with the backside here because this defender is cheating and moving towards this way. 
the big just throws a simple pass behind the defender and you can't get any more wide open than that. So all this kind of stuff, if you just, as you're running through practices, if you just constantly preach two on ones, three on twos, players start to recognize it really quickly and, and their IQ or their understanding of it, of a zone offense or just any offense goes up dramatically. So we got this one now, it's Louisville goes to the middle as well. A lot of times when it gets to the middle, that opposite side wing is wide open because somebody's got to go down and help with one of the bigs if you're playing a high-low kind of game. So kicking it out to the opposite side, now everybody's in scramble mode. So you can attack. Now here's two on one, these two players, one defender, or you can go three with this defender could be. So that's your three on two. It's a wide open shot. And then I think there's one more here that, yeah, same thing, just attack. So now this is Notre Dame. They changed it up in this game in the second half and they put a shooter in the middle, um, which caused some trouble as well. So the, it goes to the middle and there's literally, like it's just too easy for a good shooter to turn. It's, he's so good he doesn't even look at the basket on this one. He just turns and fires. <laughs> Coach, that, that really speaks to your point, um, you know, before about putting your best player in the middle. In this case, it was the best shooter. But, um, you know, to see that then come into play in that Notre Dame clip, um, I think that's very telling for coaches out there. Um, we, we actually used to, we had our zone, you know, a period in practice with our posts and our guards and we split them. We actually, would, we would work on zone offense and catching in the middle and we did some decision making and also um, the value of catching and then, you know, looking opposite and, and different things players could do in there. But we, we spent time on that in practice and I think there's some skill to that. And if you put your best player in there, I think they're gonna be a lot more comfortable like you said, um, where if you put a player that isn't used to catching the ball from all those different angles, they might struggle a little more. And I think we see that a lot more at the youth level versus, you know, high school and colleges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The When the post player is up there, you just have less that the defense thinks is going to happen. They're not going to drive. They're probably not going to look to penetrate and kick. Like there's just less that can happen so the defense can play it easier. Um, this is another option where Duke has um, Jones, their point guard, coming in from the bottom to flash middle, which, I mean, there's, on this one, there's no three on two or two on one, but when you get the point guard, the ball in the middle with a big man who's recovering towards them, it's not hard to create a two on one, um, which they do because this defender here, I think it's Hughes, but he knows they're in trouble. He's going to have to help or there's going to be a layup. And he'd rather give up that three to sort of a non-shooter. So anyways, that's when it goes to the middle with a point guard, it's, they can do a lot of damage, <laughs> even if you don't have shooters on your team. So now post touches are very similar. We'll go through this one quick, quickly. Um, but everybody's, you see everybody's head turn once the ball goes to the post. This one's almost always open in any zone, two, three, one, three, one, whatever. And then every, because everybody's in recovery mode, you can attack the gaps, open shots. Same thing here. Now here's your two on one. There's, or three on two, I guess. There's one player here, one here and one out here, and then the two top defenders. I think just two things, Dan, from those last couple of clips, um, you know, how difficult it is um, when you flash players into the zone, especially ones that don't typically, like that guard from Duke snuck in, so to yep. speak, and um, we definitely tried to take advantage of some of those um, opportunities, but it's interesting when the ball goes down into the post, how the, 
the defense really funnels down there. And I, I keep looking at those, the skip opposite uh, that's there, or even the skip to the top the last time in there. Yeah. So I, I think there's, there's definitely some value in post touches. I don't see as many teams go into the post um, against zones, though, which, which I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about now watching this, uh, you know, presentation that, that maybe there's more value in, in that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially if you have somebody who's bigger than the rest who can kind of see over if there's double teams coming or if you just have a good passing uh, post player. Um, again, you don't even have to stick a post player down there. You can put a good passer down there and they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, so this one, same kind of thing, goes down low. He's a little quick with the kick out, but it creates enough advantage. There's a lot of different gaps and quick passes and everything that happened on that one. My favorite thing is screening the zone, um, especially ball screens. They still work. Screening on the backside of the zone. You see here, when you're screening that zone, now you can, especially if you have someone who can pop, it's a great thing to have. And there you see Louisville's got a runner coming to this opposite baseline. And because that runner is coming, they know they're gonna have a three on two with the ball handler against these two guys. And this is the second, and this is the third that's coming. So now it's as simple as you're open, shoot it. If not, it goes to the corner. And then this is an interesting one here. So North Carolina goes and they decide to set inside screens on the top guys to leave a lane right down the middle. So if you have somebody who's great at pull-ups, this is a nice little Nice little play too, or a 6'10 guy who can dunk. <laughs> but that's a nice, right down the middle. And then it's creating the advantages as well, right? When that big is coming in to guard a point guard. I, th I, think, I think that's a great example too, Coach, of uh, we talked a little bit about like sets and play design. And that's a great example. You know, you, you have the athlete, but you want a way to get them into the middle of the zone and give them that opportunity to get through those first two players. And you know, when you look at the way they executed that, really, really simple. And I'm, I'm just thinking if I have a great point guard on my team, um, I'm really thinking about using that, you know, this season because I'm going to get them into the middle of the zone. And then I have options off of that for kickouts. And, and obviously, in this case, a lob. But there's a lot of options off of that. So I, I like yeah. that one a lot. Yeah, it's a good, nice way to, to get them open. Get them on the run, too. They're going downhill right away. Um, last one here for post touches this is, or ball screens or screen. Sorry, this is an off ball screen in the backside. Uh, Delorier, I think that is, is setting a screen on the bottom. His screen isn't great, but it's still enough to cause Syracuse to be in recovery mode. Um, and because of that, the quick pass down low, and he's got a good angle because he does a good job sealing as well. Um, but the post touches, ball screens, off ball screens, everything is, is um, it needs to lead to creating those three on two, two on one advantages. Sometimes when you throw it down low, you're not, you don't have that advantage yet, but you may create it with that pass. So next one, there's only two more here. Next one is get behind the zone. Hide behind it so they can't see you. So you can see usually he's in the middle right now he's hiding behind and as he flashes to the middle now here's another player behind getting behind the zone this is just keeping Syracuse a little deeper than they want to be usually they like to play up higher so you can't get those three-point shots and now we've got another player diving behind the screen and when that ball goes to the middle you have your, that was your two on one, three on two. This defender wasn't looking at all because when the ball goes to the middle, for some reason, every guy or player wants to look at the ball. 
And when you're behind the screen, no problem. They're behind the zone, sorry. So same type of thing here. This time, the post player, this is a great two-on-one. This is, you can't get any easier than this. The big does a great job of keeping his body on the middle guy so that he cannot recover in as quickly as he would want. Now he could have just laid it up and tried to go for a dunk instead and got fouled, but there's another option. Here's um, this is this is Mohawk here. Here's our team. We actually put the the point guard in the in behind the zone, so he's over here, and he sneaks in. And this is this could be same thing with post post touches. Even if you want to put your point guard in there, because he can square up and take somebody one on one and create those advantages. So what he does is just simply turns. And now because this big can't keep up with them, there's a three on two with the ball handler, these two guys in the corner against one and two. And it's an open shot. And then same thing again, goes down to the point guard. And as the ball goes down, we got the high post dive into the basket. Same thing again. It almost becomes um, instinctual, right? It's not, he just knows that the big is passing or is, is diving here. He doesn't even have to look for him. He just knows as long as this player here tries to stop him, there's gonna be an open diver to the hoop. One of the things I'm, I'm seeing a lot of these clips that I think is, is kind of cool to highlight too is, um, you know, patience. Um, you know, when as players are kind of dissecting uh, the zone, there's times where you're going to get a couple quick passes and a shot, but there was a couple of clips in there where the ball got moved around a little bit and, you know, teams were patient. They got the zone to rotate. They created a mini advantage. They drove, they kicked, they made one more, and then they got the shot. So um, it's interesting in, in seeing these clips that there's some elements of teams showing the, their patience. They're not necessarily just one pass and, and taking a shot each time. Yeah, especially when there's no uh, shot clocks where you guys are, you can. <laughs> we so we I'm here in Canada, Canada, we have one. So. We have one. We're one of the few states, but if you go uh, into many of the states, I think there's only ten states in in, in the U.S. that have a, a shot clock, mm -hmm. and the other states don't. So patience becomes even more uh, important in those cases, of course. Yeah, yeah. So last one, um, rebound. If you can't shoot. Um, the best way to create your advantages. You don't have any people who can drive. You don't have ball handlers or shooters. Crash the boards. That's your best way. This is a kind of a sloppy possession, but it shows the importance of, of rebounding here. So we've got one, the ball handler. We've got two and three against two. Shot goes up, offensive rebound. Next time, same type of thing. So there's one, two, three against two. So if you're hitting the glass, you, you'll be able to get a lot of extra possessions out of it. There's another one. Just from simply crashing the, gra the glass, Louisville does this really well against Syracuse. So actually that one um, I'd like to point out. So this is also kind of hide, both the bigs are kind of hiding behind the zone, which creates an even bigger advantage rebounding. Usually long shots lead to long rebounds, but when they don't, you pretty much gobble up every one of these rebounds. Coach, philosophically, just um, for the coaches out there, um, you know, personally, we ran dribble drive and we were always um, four to the boards and we, that was to our advantage against the zone. Um, we got a lot of extra opportunities as a result. So philosophically, what do you, typically, how many do you send to the boards? I know this is always a hot topic. So what, what's yeah. your philosophy on this? I like three going. Um, it doesn't have to be the same three all the time, but I would say two for sure are the same two always going. I have your bigs if you want it to be them. Um, if you have two post players on. Um, and then a, a uh, fourth person kind of in that 
high posts, like foul line extended kind of area for, for any long rebounds, or they can jam that first outlet pass. If you, if you're playing against somebody who's, who's a good fast breaking team. Um, but I go three plus a long rebounder and then one, one stay back, obviously. Um, it depends how, how experienced your team is. Um, but I wouldn't, I would, I would go against labeling somebody you are always the safety um, because a lot of times the point guards are the most instinctual players and they can read balls coming off the rim better than a lot of people. And they have a good angle from 20 feet away. It's easier to see where the rebounds are going. Um, so I don't, yeah, I would, I would caution against labeling at all costs, but um, two, two in for sure. Two bigs in for sure if you have two bigs and a fourth one kind of hanging out for long rebounds and then one safety. Yeah, and I, I like what you said there too about not um, labeling that player as a, you know, you're always going to be the back player because I think you're taking away some of the opportunity for them to make decisions and get extra possessions for your team when they have a chance to. And so I, I definitely agree with that, you know, in terms of labeling someone, hey, you're always – going to be that player and especially the point guard like you said because you know they're, they're usually pretty heady out there and and they um know how to get themselves in the right spot and those long rebounds i think a lot of times your point guard can get their hands on so um, yeah that, a lot that, of times that's, that's a great point know where it's going yeah they know where it's going beforehand there i see a lot of times high school teams and you can tell that point guard's been told do not offensive rebound so they'll take a step or two on those baseline shots that you know they're going on the other side of the rim. They'll take a step or two to go get it, and then they, they know they've been yelled at enough times so they're not going to go get it, but it's a possession you just lost out on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great, great, great point. So Louisville does a good job. They, they get uh, their wings crash the glass really well against this zone. Um, so here – even on this, there's a three on two component to it as well, where one person's crashing, one's already down. So these two are responsible for that. And this guy's not looking at anything. So there's an open player. There's your three on two. And then it creates pass back to where it came from. Same type of situation here where it's just, coming in the bigs are just occupying bodies for the wings to come flying in and get rebounds so there is those are the 10 things that i like to kind of challenge people on um, the 10 ways that you can create it there's obviously the one um elephant in the room if you want to call it but that three on twos and two on ones originated from is just get out and run and if you've got that in your arsenal then go for it because the one thing i would say is when you are running against a zone that whoever the ball handler is either has to pass ahead of that first wave of defenders or they're going to have to get by that first wave of defender because the way that people stop running, which they have here. So this driver had no intention of actually scoring. He knew that these two guys were going to be open if he took the ball deep enough. It was funny as, as I was watching that clip, I was seeing, and probably everyone watching it is seeing that same, you know, attack and that same kick for a shot opportunity. Is there anything that, you know, you do in practice or your team does a drill or any type of small sided game or anything like that to help players with that? I'm thinking like a, a great transition drill where players have that uh, experience driving and then, you know, getting in and convert. There's three defenders there. So I'm thinking of a high school player. They might see those three defenders and stop and pull it out where yeah. this is an experienced college player that drives and makes a great great kick for an opportunity so is there anything that you do or that you would recommend teams do um, to practice those types of situations 
Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, just the, you know, the, the one where we have uh, the offensive players jogging around in a circle while the coach shoots. They get the rebound and take it and go. You take mm -hmm. it and go against four, four players instead of all five. That's a good way to find your advantages. Um, because obviously if you're choosing to fast break, maybe somebody is lagging behind. So you're five on four. Um, and those same game-like situations and decision-making stuff comes up all the time. Um, and then same thing when you're going back down the other way. Uh, you can do the shooter stays out on defense. So then it's five on four going the other way. You can – there's lots of different ways. that Transition is, is a big thing um, that I like to practice because it's just – most of the game is spent in transition and there's not enough – time spent practicing that so if you can practice those little you know going to offense to defense and not defense to offense and where your advantages are instantly um it's a it's a huge iq booster when you're doing it in practice all the time that's a great point on transition and actually um i know the drills have so many different names we um we the, the circle up we call that war we started it different ways that was our war drill and that's actually one of my favorite drills all time to do with the team yeah. because there's so many things that come out of it. And, um, you know, your point on transition and how much time we spend, you know, in that part of the game, um, you know, during a specific game is so important. And, and, you know, the amount of time that, you know, I wonder how much time coaches really spend in practice. You hear a lot about half court and, you know, uh, defense and offense, but transition so critical. And I, I just wonder if teams are spending – uh, kind of to your point, enough time on that in practice. Yeah, I think it's a lot of half court stuff. I mean, I'm generalizing, obviously, but it's a lot of half court stuff. And maybe you play full five on five, full court, but there's not a lot of um, situational breakdown kind of stuff. Like even for that war um, drill that you're talking about, that I was explaining, even if the next team that you're playing is a great fast breaking team, you can use that drill to now jam that first outlet pass, run the exact same drill. And your only focus is make sure that first outlet pass doesn't catch the ball on the move. They just have to stop or go backwards or do, do something else where they can't run at you. Um, Absolutely. Yes. So this is another one. Um, they get out and run and it's same, same concept. There's, Technically, you could say that he has stopped the ball. Louisville doesn't agree. He keeps going, and now he's created a three-on-two. So there's one in the corner, one down here, and then this, the point guard, is against these two defenders. And just like three-on-two, two-on-one, as you teach and practices, if the ball does, they don't stop the ball, just keep going. So he keeps going. And I got one more here. I think that's it. And then, so this is just to pass ahead of that first wave. It doesn't always have to be dribbling. Just um, one question on um, that last, that last play or a couple of the sets that we saw today where teams came down in transition, a um, couple of recent sets, and it was a, a kick out for a three or um, I, I personally, those are good shots for me because it's an open shot. Um, you know, what, what do you think? You know, I obviously saw your team do it, but philosophically, is that something that you guys try to take advantage of as much as possible, those in transition and then, you know, those, those kick out threes and things like that? Are those Definitely. good options for you? Yeah, without a doubt. So my, uh, my brother's the head coach, yep. and he, um, he loves to shoot. <laughs> so <laughs> there's – and he also has a, a great philosophy as well that I totally agree with. And I think um, Golden State probably has the same kind of thing with Steve Kerr is you're not second guessing. You're, you're allowed to shoot. You're not second guess, being second guessed. So your percentages are going to be higher because you're not in your own head wondering if this is a good shot. Is it not a good shot? Is it too early? Should I swing it? What should like just if you're going to shoot, shoot. You'll never be taken off because you missed a shot. 
I love, I mean, I love that philosophy. That was me. I, I, I love to shoot as well. So I think uh, your brother and I have that, that in common, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I philosophically, I think that that's a great way and to play and, you know, you're giving players opportunities to get out and score. And I'm just thinking about um, how important the alignment was in a lot of these sets, whether it was getting the ball into the post, getting the ball into the high post, where you start and where the play ended up, you know, the beginning part is so important because you're creating these mini three on two or two on ones. And I think that's so critical uh, how they start out in these sets and then where it ends up. Um, And I'm, I'm wondering, um, I know your site does a great job with, um, you know, sharing out a lot of different sets, really meaningful ones to take advantage of the specific areas, whether it's zone offense, man offense, whatever it might be. Um, so I don't know if you have some time to maybe take us through um, your site or maybe show people who are interested how they can sign up. And I don't, I don't know if you have any examples or anything like that, but if you have yep. time for it, Coach, I would love um, to see some of that. Definitely. I can show you a few of the plays that are on our site for zone offense. Um, they'll get into a little more uh, screening and all that kind of stuff as well. So it, um, definitely, let's, let's get to it. I'll, one of the things I want to add too is I didn't really talk about with the, the alignment that you were just saying. Equally as important as the alignment is the spacing while the play is developing. It's like any three on two, two on one. If you're standing beside each other, you're not actually two, you're just one person, right? So um, spacing is equally important. If there's a pass coming to the wing and you're standing beside somebody, you better move over six or eight feet so you can be part of that two on one. Great point, great point. Okay, so here's our site. Um, We'll get into the plays. Go. Okay, so here's our our site here for you can look at man to man or zone plays. Obviously, we're talking about zone offense. So, because we've looked at a lot of two three zone um, so far with Syracuse, we'll take a look at maybe the ball screen play here we have for two three zone. So we also have some keys to success, how long it takes, and some other drills to help get better at running this play. So now we're just five setting a screen for one. And we're trying to create those three on two, two on one situations, right? So one, three, and fours coming over are going to be against these two defenders. Usually the big would come up a little more on the ball screen probably, but um, if they do, even better because now we've got multiple three on twos. Three and four against these two defenders four and two against these two defenders. So wherever the defense chooses, they're, they're in trouble. So you can play it whichever way you'd like. If the defenders do that, if the defenders do one and four, then three's wide open. Coach, different than the, uh, I know you mentioned this, but different than the still shots that we see out there, which are great. And anyone who's sharing the game, you know, obviously I appreciate, but what I think really sets you apart and why I I love your site and I go to it and I use your stuff is because the timing is there. Like as I saw that first dribble and I saw the guard slide out and then I saw the ball screen come up, but also the different options because you know, sometimes we don't see that all the time. So to, as you kind of took us through there, you could see the different options, if this, then that. And I think that's really, really helpful for coaches because from every set, there's a lot of different things that can happen. So I I appreciate that, um, you know, you provide coaches with that opportunity. Um, I think it kind of goes above and beyond what what I see out there. No, thanks. Okay, we'll get to another play here then we'll go a couple of three two zone half court we'll do a couple of quick plays here same one four set for um against the three two zone or one two two depending on uh, what your terminology is so 
So as the ball is entered to the one high post, five is diving ball side, which takes the bottom defenders are now occupied and pulled away. One is pulled very far away. And so there's your two on one. And especially on the two on ones, you have time. Um, so ball fakes, pass fakes, they can help enormously to kind of shift that defender and get them off balance for one second and pass it to the other person. Um, another option out of that one four. I'll open up new tabs, it's a little quicker. <clears throat> so now it goes to the wing. So ball sides diving, taking up space so that the bottom defender can't get by. And now because the ball's on the wing, that wing is guarding. Now we've got our two on one there when the other post dives. So these are the kinds of plays that are in the website. Um, could show you one more maybe if you want, or we can we can go with questions, whatever whatever you want to do. Well, one thing I I would love to see one more coach, and one thing I just want to point out here is you know you see a three three two or one two two, however you want to title it, like you said, but a lot of teams go to kind of your traditional two one two. And something I started to do as I coached a couple years, because I, I used that 2 one two and different sets off of it, but I started to use some 1-4 um, against zone offenses. Um, and I, I appreciate you sharing that. What do you think the benefit or what is the benefit in terms of going to a 1-4 set versus your traditional, you know, say a 2 one two? against a 3-2 zone. And I, I saw some things in there, but from, from your perspective, what are some of the benefits of that? I just love that it's, it's, it pulls the defenders out of where they think they're supposed to be. Like if they're basically turned into man-to-man -man or they can't stop you. Like there's no way to possibly guard four across. Whether you're four high or four low, it just, there's no zone that is set up that way. So it, it's, whether you're one three one or two three zone, whatever you want to run, you can't guard those four players. Yeah, that's a great point. I hope you know as coaches watch this. Um, I, I I do think that's a little outside the box thinking. You don't see a ton of one four against zones. We're seeing more of it now, but I think coaches can really take advantage of that. I know that I did, and just seeing those clips, I love the little uh, the ball screen in there too. But there's a lot of ways to take advantage against zones using that type of setup um, for the points that you made. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. And if there's one more uh, set you want to, uh, you know, share that, that'd be awesome. Sure. Um, so here's one, this could be just a play that you want to run. Um, if you have a, a post player that's dominating. So the goal with the, the, this play is, the main thing that needs to happen is the point guard needs to take on two players. So they need to take on that top player and the wing player, at least attack the gap. If they don't get stopped, then that's fine. You keep going. But like we saw with the one Duke clip and a couple other ones, attack that gap knowing that you probably aren't going to get through the gap. So know what's going to happen next. So what's going to happen next because this is if one three one if the the one is is running baseline to baseline, you're gonna go here now. Even though these players are open, they can even one can five can dive to the basket here, or five can set screen for four to dive. There's lots of different options as that ball. We'll rewind it here as it goes to the corner. There's lots of different ways to handle how we're running through I mean this I gotta is be a, honest I, I'm watching that and I'm seeing five dive to the basket but I'm also knowing playing against um you know a one three one that there, there's recovery there and that player at the high post could easily dive yeah. down 
cover. And if that starts to happen, now you take five, let them screen that player and have someone else dive down. So um, again, I mean, that that's an awesome set. And then to see the different options off of it, um, you know, kind of come out. I, if, if When you pause it here, I'm saying five is going to cut to the basket and then, yeah. oh, he sets that screen. So I, I love that you have um, the different options off of these plays. And um, that's one I wouldn't have thought of at first, you know, first looking at the play. There's a possibility that I have a play that's named the same thing, but post up for center. So it's just the same that goes to five. You don't need that screen for four to dive, but yeah, it's, there's, I mean, with that one, three, one, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can um, take advantage of, of the low post players. That if you have two, even if you don't have two, you can, these uh, short corner spots are gold mines against the one, three, one. So coach, how can, you know, I'm, I'm watching, if I'm watching this and I'm a coach, I'm thinking to myself, how can I get access uh, to Coach Call's uh, timeout um, because of the amount of resources and really just your overall knowledge of the game too. Um, you just shared, you shared so many great points with us today and how can they get access to Coach Call's timeout? Um, and, it, you know, do you run any, I know a lot of sites have special offers and things that go at different times. So if people are watching this, is there, are there any opportunities for them if they sign up now? And, you know, just in general, how can they get that access? Yeah, so the, the website is coachcallstimeout.com. Um, you can sign up now or any time that you see this video. And if you use the, we got a coupon code that is, uh, just use the coupon code BETTER, B-E-T-T-E-R, because we're getting better every day, right, John? <laughs> Absol absolutely. I, pre I appreciate that, uh, the use of that word. I think that's a, I think that's a good one. People, people will remember it. So yeah. So if, if you use better when you're signing up, you'll get 30% off uh, for life on anything, anything on the site. So there's a membership side of the site. If you're a member, it can be monthly or annually. You get access to everything that's on the site from now until whatever I can create in the future. Um, and then there's courses and stuff that are individual items but if you're a member you get access to all the courses as well so can you, if you um, better you get 30 percent off whatever whatever you'd like that is awesome what are um when you mentioned courses there um what are some of the courses if people sign up what are some of the things that they can they can learn so right now we have uh practice planning um so how do you run your practices so that everybody's working hard and wants to be there and I see on Twitter a lot of times people are, our coaches are complaining about kids arriving late or people quitting and all that kind of stuff. I, I feel like practices are maybe the main reason that that's happening. Either they just, it's not fun or they're not engaged. They're waiting in lines while everybody else is doing stuff. Um, so we have a practice planning course that teaches you how to run drills so that nobody's sitting around waiting and getting bored. Um, and then we give you access to all the, the drills and all that kind of stuff as well. Well, that's um, that the practice planning alone is worth its weight in gold coach, because I think that's probably, um, you know, as a, a new coach, that's probably one of the toughest things is how to purposefully plan your practices and really think about, um, you know, keeping kids engaged. So, I mean, that alone is uh, worth its weight in gold, so to, so to speak. Yeah, one of the things I, I mean, I never believed in it um, until you start to think back. You're like, oh, when I was playing, I can tell exactly which coaches I had who were prepared and had a practice ready and who didn't. And the ones that didn't, there you would spend three, four minutes in between every drill waiting to figure out what they wanted to do or lining up for the next thing. They're explaining it. And everybody just loses momentum. I mean, it's just you get you get bored right there's so many other things for kids to be doing nowadays they're just going to go do whatever they're having fun at <laughs> absolutely so i just had one other question and i don't know if there's any uh parting words you want to leave us with as well but the last question i have is if if someone is a member on your site um and they're having an issue and i know you have, you have sets for everything I've, I've i've gone through them that's how i know um, but if someone had a particular question about something, do you guys offer up, um, obviously you can direct them to some of the stuff you have and 
are you guys creating new content, um, you know, throughout, you know, each weekly or monthly? I mean, I know this is a huge task, so I think even monthly is great, but are you, how, how often are you updating the content? And if people are every, their- every month, there's new stuff coming out. So every month at the end of the month, I send out an email to all the members that says, wow. here's the new stuff. Uh, try to give them some, some different articles and things that I have found throughout the month that would help them out. Um, any game film kind of stuff, which is tougher now because the NBA is not going, NCAA is not going, so it's harder to find the game film stuff. But <laughs> um, yeah, we I add new plays, new drills. I've got a bank of probably thirty different plays or thirty thirty different drills that um, that I need to get to <laughs> create, and I have all the video. We I film our practices, so I have all the video for them. I just haven't been able to get to them yet, but every month there's new ones coming. That's, I mean, to, to have that updated on a monthly basis and just that constant flow of new stuff that's um, coming out. And, and I, I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that you have that you want to add on, but I think it's good as it comes in monthly to have a little bit at a time, because I think so sometimes it can be overwhelming too. And what I love about what you put up is the organization piece and, you know, how much is too much at some point. I think you really focus in uh, on certain areas and things coaches can do. And I think that's, that, that's important because there's so much stuff out there and that can be overwhelming as well. So I love that you do it monthly and you just add in, you know, X amount of things every month. And then, you know, coaches know they're going to continuously be able to, um, you know, grow their expertise on the game. So I, I just, I think that's awesome. Um, is there anything coach that, you know, you'd like to share anything else you want to say to coaches out there as we, uh, you know, part ways here today? No, I would, um, I would just say if you're planning for next season, which I guess everybody is at this point, um, just think about as you're watching maybe your old game film, game ESPN classics, whatever's on, look at even man-to-man offenses, look at those three on two, two on one situations and start to in your mind, break it down that way. So then when you go back to the season, you know how you want to term it in your terminology, whatever your program uses for terminology, you know what you want to say and how you want to deal with um, finding those and creating those advantages. Great advice. Tons of great information here today. Um, you know, with zone offense and creating those mini advantages, three on two, two on one, um, and also taking us through your site. I really appreciate you taking extra time today to share your site because I think there's so much value in there, and I really hope coaches uh, take advantage of that opportunity. So thank you so much, Dan. Um, I appreciate having you uh, today, and I hope we can do this again because um, this this was awesome. So thank you. Yeah, maybe we can do a, a baseline out of bounds one or something like that as well, yeah. I would, I would love, I would love to see that, and I'm sure coaches are going to be reaching out asking, uh, <laughs> "Hey, when are you guys going to be doing that after today?" So, yeah. thanks so much. Uh, stay safe and uh, have a great day. Thanks, John. Thanks for everything you're doing as well. You're doing a Thank great you. job sharing the game. Thank you.